before we actually start uh, this session about uh, equestrian safety, we're just going to very quickly show you a beaver video that I think is highly pertinent to this. We're here today at Burley Lodge Equestrian Centre making some videos on behalf of the British Equine Veterinary Association. We're going to look at some techniques which are based on an understanding of how horses learn, which are very simple but very effective to deal with horses which are needle shy, ear shy or just generally phobic of the vet. These videos are really aimed at keeping horses safe, keeping vets safe, keeping owners safe and I hope you find them really useful. Hi, I'm Tim Stockdale, and don't break your vet. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Just to put that into context, um, just to put that into con context, um, an equine vet may expect to sustain between seven and eight work-related injuries that impede them from practicing during a 30-year working life. So it does have real resonance because unless we've got an active uh, I was going to say workable, but uh, ac active uh, veterinary profession, we do potentially always have problems. So hopefully that's something that's relevant and germane to this whole session uh, about equestrian safety. Uh, and the first up, we've got Alan Hickscox, uh, for, who's the Director of Safety for the British Horse Society. And he's going to talk about influencing uh, driver behaviour when passing horses on the road. Alan, over to you. Uh, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, the British Horse Society safety team deal with all the concerns for safety for horse riders, horse owners and carriage drivers. We deal with incidents with fireworks, drones, low-flying aircraft, dog attacks, but I would say that 90% of our work is to deal and actually influence the way that horses and riders are perceived and are driven past by, uh, by cars. Now, horsepower. It's interesting to see where this term comes from. Industrial Revolution, the new steam engines, and uh, James Watt, the eminent mechanical engineer. His uh, uh, picture is up in the, uh, the council chamber up here. He said that, I want to compare these new machines with something. So he chose horses, and the term horsepower came about. And horse owners are a little bit unsure about this because they could see that their livelihood may be in agriculture and maybe operating these machines. They were actually under threat. Fast forward to the 20th century. Newfangled automobiles are on the roads. And again, that, uh, that sort of relationship between the real horsepower, horses, and brake horsepower now is a little bit uneasy. And then we fast forward again to the 21st century today and that relationship between the real horsepower and brake horsepower is still an uneasy one.
So we released or launched our Dead Slow campaign two years ago and we released it because we've been keeping statistics since 2010 and when we released them two years ago it was shocking by anybody's standards and immediately we launched the campaign on BBC Breakfast, MP stood up in Parliament and asked the Department of Transport what they're doing about the safety of horses on the roads. The CEO of the Driving Instructors Association contacted us that morning, how can I help you educate drivers? So now, today, we're actually releasing the new figures that we've collected on our Horse Accidents website. And this is what's happened over the last seven years. There's been 2,900 reports of incidents involving horses on the roads. 39 riders have been killed. 230 horses have died at the scene or because of their injuries. And 840 horses have been injured. And this is what I think the next one that is most interesting, really, because it says 85% of those incidents are because cars are passing too fast or too close or both past the horse. So you could argue that 85% of those figures are avoidable. And this is it year, year on year. You'll see when we launched the Horse Accidents website, um, obviously there was a bit of historical reporting, so it's very high, and then it drops, and then it begins to rise again. And then when you see in 2016, when we launched the Horse Accident website, again, more media coverage, more reports, but I can, I'm pleased to announce, although the figures are still shocking, that it's beginning to drop, which is encouraging, especially the number of horses that were killed. 21 last year, eight horses on the roads this year. Three strands. I'll come to safer drivers in a minute, but safer riders, and that is interesting as well, because we want riders to take their responsibilities for the shared use of the road as well. We want them to wear conspicuous clothing. We want them to thank drivers. We want them to be aware of their obligations under the highway code. So it's really important that riders take their responsibilities as well, and that will lead to safer horses. But safer drivers. We are educating drivers on how to pass horses safely, and trying to influence driver behaviour when they see a horse on the road. We want to improve their knowledge, because we're not saying, you know, do this, do this. We want to let them know why they should pass horses safely. So give them the knowledge, that will improve their attitude and it will improve their behaviour. And when we talk to driving groups, and we're doing a lot of that at the moment, they say, well, what do riders face on the roads? And we show them these videos. Now, you can see a vulnerable road user, pedestrian, has just crossed in front, Lorry driver stops with them, but puts the accelerator on, no care at all, and drives straight past these horses. Now, I've removed the sound from this video, because you could say the language is somewhat colourful. They weren't discussing the price of broccoli at Sainsbury's, I can assure you that. But, you know, and, and the drivers thought, OK, I, I get that. And then um, this next one that you saw, you wouldn't think there's room for a lorry past there. The car stopped, but then along comes the, the lorry. And as having been in the mounted police, let me tell you, that would have made a very good police horse there. So the drivers are saying, the penny drops a little bit. Oh, I can see what you mean about what riders have to face on the roads. So dead or dead slow, that is our campaign. And what we're saying to them, we're actually giving them, believe it or not, a recognised behavioural change technique. It's called implementation intervention. So what we're saying to drivers and asking them to say, if I see a horse on the road, then I will. And these are the four messages. Slow down to a maximum of 15 miles an hour. Be patient. I won't sound my horn. I won't rev my engine. When safe to do so, I will pass the horse wide and slow, at least the car's width, if possible, and I will drive slowly away. A behavioural change technique. And what we're saying to drivers is, horses don't want to be on the roads. We don't want to be on the roads. It'd be great if there's off, safe off-road access everywhere, but be riding from a bridleway or a multi-user route to another bridleway or multi-user route, or riding from a stable to a bridleway. And they're saying, oh, what, you don't really want to be on the roads. No, we don't. The penny drops a little bit further. We say there's three brains working. All right, you've got your drivers. All right, you've got the riders. But don't forget the horse's brain. 
they are flight animals. And they're working, I don't want to anthropomorphise this too much, but they're working to a risk assessment that's thousands and thousands of years old. They're either going to remove that risk by kicking, they're going to reduce that risk by moving away, or they're actually going to try and avoid that risk by turning around and spinning the other way. Haven't we all been there? But the drivers say, OK, penny drops a little bit more. And then, with driver's help and riders training their horses, we can help the horses to accept that risk. So the drivers say, OK, so if I do pass wide and slow, and I do slow down to a maximum of 15 miles an hour, I can help the horses to accept that risk that they might want to either remove, reduce, or avoid. Yes, penny drops a little bit more. Remove, reduce, avoid, and accept that risk. I say to them, even the best trained horses may react to something. And I can tell you, police horses, there's no such thing as bomb-proof. There might just be a flick of an ear or a movement of a muscle, but they will react. Okay, I'm getting it. Horses may react to something. We talk about the horse's eyesight. You know, 285 degrees monocular sight, 65 degrees binocular, and there are these blind areas, small one at the front, large one at the back. Oh, right, okay. And the horse's eye is trained, it's going to pick up a predator, and their behaviour might affect what they see. All right, horse's eyesight. Okay, I'm getting it. I tell them, we see a puddle on the road. Horse might see a sinkhole. We see the little sparrow in the hedge. The horse may see the pterodactyl. I can see some understanding here. We see the crisp packet. The horse is going to see that ghost. And the drivers, the penny drops a little bit. Oh, horse's eyesight, three brains working. You don't really want to be on the road. OK, my knowledge is expanding. I'm getting it. We tell them that horses can move very, very quickly. They weigh three quarters of a tonne, and they are going to do serious damage to your car. Chris Goffey, ex-top gear presenter, very good rider. He's actually getting a message out to driving organisations and drivers that we wouldn't be able to get. That might be the message as horse owners would want to hear, but he's saying, if you don't care about the horse, don't care about the rider, imagine what damage that is going to cause to your pride and joy and your classic car. We're actually showing them how quickly horses can move. So we're showing them this, uh, this, this video here. Oh, look at this. Just watch the, uh, the cameraman the there. At the look at the cameraman here in the background as the horse Slim Shady kicks out. Okay. Luckily his camera was in There's the way. There's all the there. Well, Once, twice. And the drivers are thinking, that is how fast, and that was in slow motion. That is how far the reach of a horse can be. Once, twice. And they're going, okay, I'm getting it. That's why I pass wide and slow. And there's this one as well that we show them. So, yes, all right, don't condone the branding. But that horse has thought there's a risk there. I'm going to remove that risk. The driver's never seen that before. I'm getting the message now. The penny is nearly always all the way to the bottom. We tell them about their obligations under the highway code. You know, rule 215. Be particularly careful when you pass horses. Pass wide and slow. The riders could be children's. Children, they might be riding double file because the horse on the inside may be inexperienced. You know, look out for riders' signals. You know, heed their advice if they're asking you to stop or to slow down. And treat every horse as a potential hazard. So it's there in the highway code, 215. You know, we're not, I'm not asking them to put the highway code under their pillow at night, but there it is, it's in the, in the highway code. The penny is almost to the bottom now. So dead or dead slow, that is our campaign. If I see a horse on the road, then I will slow down to a maximum of 15 miles an hour. I will be patient, I won't sound my horn, I won't rev my engine. When safe to do so, I will pass the horse wide and slow, least the car's width, and I will drive slowly away. So we're saying to them, observe the dead slow advice and we are going to save lives. Horses' lives, riders' lives and drivers' lives. Some of the work the British Horse Society have been doing since the launch of the dead slow is we had a Westminster Hall debate in July last year about the safety of horses. The transport minister was there, and he heard about our horse accidents website and our stats, and he offered the Department of Transport statisticians to work with us so we can actually look at our, our stats. And University of College London are doing some work with us, making the horse accidents website much more uh, in tune and available to compare to Stats 19, the police statistics, and hospital statistics. Our Dead Slow campaign has been linked with the Government Think campaign. 3.5 million views when it came out. More than Beyonce, more than Game of Thrones. British Horse Society, Beyonce, Game of Thrones, who would have thought? 
We won the Driver Education Campaign of the Year um, with the, uh, the Driving Instructors Association in 2016. And, you know, one of the reasons that we won that was because we weren't pointing the finger at drivers and saying, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. We were saying, no, riders have a responsibility for that shared use of the road as well. And they liked that. We've done a webinar with the, the Driving Instructors Association. Motor Schools Association is on board. IAM Road Smart are there with us. BBC Country File, we we're on there. 7.2 million viewers saw and heard about our Dead Slow campaign. Transport Research Laboratory, we commissioned a report on the conspicuity of riders on the roads. We were at, there's two, two outcomes we wanted from that. We wanted to maximise the likelihood that motorised users can detect horses on the roads and be able to accurately judge, and this is the important one, the speed and the distance when they come to it. So it came up with three recommendations. Where horses are significantly used on the roads, speed limits should be reduced and enforced. The second one, Riders should utilise the use of LED lights on our shoulders and on the points of hip. So we exaggerate the width of the horse as opposed to the height of the horse. And it talks about um, wearing high visibility clothing and all the time, but be aware of the background, but also the biomotion cues of the high-vis leggings. Really important uh, bit of work. We now have scientific evidence that proves and explains why riders should be wearing conspicuous clothing. <laughs> Police units, we've got a tremendous um, relationship with some police units. North Yorkshire Police with their Operation Spartan, Greater Manchester Police with their Operation Considerate, the Welsh Police Force with their Operation Snap, where they are asking for riders to submit their helmet cam footage and then they will look at it, either advise the drivers or actually take action and enforce. Also, there's the close pass operation, which is used for cyclists. Uh, coppers come out in plain clothes and they drive, uh, ride along on, on cycles. People that pass too close to bicycles get stopped by a traffic car further up the road. We are actually having plain clothes police officers in Scotland, mounted units out, and they are in the same way. Cars passing too fast or too close are being stopped. And we're looking at that with other mounted units around the country. We've been training the driver trainers of Acada.com's Morrisons, Next, John Lewis, Waitrose. You know, and they're driver trainers. We're going in and giving this presentation. And they're a bit of a tough crowd, these driver trainers. What can you tell me about passing horses? When we've given them all this, uh, these messages, they're there writing things down. We had a note back from uh, Waitrose uh, yesterday. Thank you so much for your training. We are going to include that in all our CPC packages. Other vulnerable road user groups. I gave a, a presentation at a road safety conference, and I called us the forgotten vulnerable road user. The motorcyclists, no, we are the forgotten vulnerable road user. The cyclists, no, we are. So we got together. If we're all vulnerable road users and we think we're forgotten, surely our voice together, because of the same messages, you know, will be there. We've got the dead slow advice in these two publications, the official DVS guide to driving, you know, the essential skills, the official DVSA theory test for the drivers of large vehicles. Who would have thought that that, our dead slow message, would be in those two publications? Only just been published. DVSA, very supportive of our campaign. So, dead or dead slow. We're working with all the right agencies. We're working with all the right stakeholders. And we've got some exceptional partnerships with the Department of Transport, with the police, with road safety organisations, with um, the Driving Instructors Association. So what I'm asking you to do is spread the dead slow message with your colleagues, with your friends, and you know, we, go, we can come out, we can do presentations anywhere for this. And Horse Accidents website, you know, please, even if you're involved in a near miss, a near miss, please put it onto our Horse Accidents website, which is available on the BHS website. So, hopefully you can see I'm very passionate about this and I'm totally committed to increasing the safety of horses on the roads. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alan. That was uh, a thought-provoking and a stimulating presentation. Um, we're going to take questions at the end of these four uh, papers, so if you bear that in mind. If you want to store up any questions, that would be great. Our next paper, looking at current R&D in hel uh, helmet design and testing, was, to, was going to be given by uh, Professor Michael Gilchrist from University College Dublin. Unfortunately, uh, he's not able to make it due to ill health, and therefore I'm delighted that we have Michio Clark, who's a research fellow 
uh, from the University College of Dublin, who's the one who's actually doing the work. So, in fact, um, you're going to get the truth now. But just be bearing in mind, Michio, that your supervisor is watching, um, uh, is watching on live streaming. So, that's fine. <laughs> so, Michio, over to you. Hey, Your Royal Highness, late Lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the, for the introduction. So today I'll be discussing kind of the current research and development in helmet designs, uh, testings, and kind of dealing with rotational impacts. So kind of a little bit about the project that I'm a part of is the HEADS project. So it's kind of a European project funded under the American Curie uh, training program. So there's 13 PhD positions in total with six partners covering five, five countries. So we have three academic partners, the University College Dublin, KTH in Stockholm, Sweden, and KU Leuven in Belgium, as well as three industry partners representing sports, such as cycling, motorcycle, snow sports, and equestrian. And those partners are Laser Sports in Belgium, AGV in Italy, and Charles Owen here in the UK. Who said the, the main goal of the project is to better understand head injury and then hopefully design better tests and helmets to help protect against those injuries. So within that, there's kind of three main topics that the head projects covers. So that's accident reconstruction, head model refinement, and finally, standards development. So my research is focused on the accident reconstruction. So, and, and as well, kind of, that kind of feeds into the help develop the standards. So the kind of sports that we are looking at again are to cycling, uh, motorcycle, snow sports, and of course equestrian. And in terms of the head model refinement, there's a large range of topics that we cover to try to better characterize the tissue in the head and brain. So kind of some aspects that we're looking at are how much energy does the scalp absorb in an impact, for, for instance. How can we uh, better characterizing bridging veins or looking at developing elderly models um, in the heads. So, as I said, I'll today I'll focus on the equestrian aspect of, of things, of our research. Um, so, question, uh, horseback racing and uh, equestrian sports, obviously very popular worldwide. However, getting on these horses can be particularly risky due to the height above the ground, to speed, mass, and kind of unpredictability of the horse. So, this creates an environment in which injuries are most caused by being thrown from the horse. And one of the most common injuries is head injuries. Now, helmets have greatly reduced the amount of traumatic brain injuries that we see, so such as skull fractures and other severe injuries. But concussion remains uh, one of the most common injuries. Now, a lot of research in concussions has been completed in sports such as ice hockey or American football, but there's been very little attention to uh, equestrian sports. So we don't, at the moment, there's very little understanding of what are these what are these mechanisms that cause brain injury in equestrian sports? That kind of leads to the purpose of, of this research is one, to try to understand what are the loading conditions which cause these brain injuries in equestrian sports and how can we better develop uh, helmet test standards to, to reflect those. So the manner in which the head is, is loaded is very important because this will change the, the response of the head in terms of your kinematics and also the brain brain tissue deformation. As well, it will also affect the protective capacity of, of the helmet. So currently, a lot of the research in, it, in the equestrian side of things has focused on more looking at impacts to rigid surfaces. Now, this is to do with the standards uh, impacting steel. However, even though there's a risk of impacting rigid surfaces, such as the concrete road, horse's hoof, or a fence, there's higher probability of impacting the soft surfaces such as sand or, or turf. And kind of this is where the study of real world accidents can really help us better understand what are these conditions which cause these brain injuries. And for once we kind of understand the conditions that cause brain injury, then we could feed this information to helmet manufacturers and helmet design committees to hopefully eventually develop better helmet, helmet standards and then ultimately better tests so you can kind of better protect uh, riders such as my wife in the bottom bottom corner there. So kind of the areas of research that I'll focus on 
our work that my, myself and uh, Tom Connor have, have completed. Um, so that real world accident reconstruction and then kind of the, and then analyzing kind of the, the helmet damage from those and as well the standard development. So, so far we uh, have been able to reconstruct cases from the Turf Club in, in Ireland as well as uh, cases from British Eventing. We're currently working with the British Horse Racing Society to gather cases from them as well. So in total, we've, we've gathered over 200 videos um, from, from those different organizations. And I'll just kind of show you uh, two examples of kind of the videos that we, that we get and the subsequent reconstructions. So from, the, from these videos, we can use it to analyze, kind of, okay, determine where the impact location was, how fast was the horse coming in, kind of what was the body position going into this impact, and kind of use that to feed into the computer simulation, which will, which will follow these, these clips here. And as you can see here, this is an example from racing, which is helpful to us because we have these multiple camera angles that you're now seeing, which really give us a good idea from many different perspectives how this accident occurred. This is kind of the last clip, and then the computer simulation will come. So really, once we take the impact location, body, we can manipulate that computer simulation. So as you see here, and we kind of recreate the same thing we see in the video. And then that, that would also feed the actual physical dummy reconstruction as well. So from the, madam, from, the, uh, from the computer simulation, we can get the velocity and kind of angle, and we have the location, which feeds into that physical reconstruction. And then from there, we can understand kind of the kinematics of the head and as well uh, feed that into a brain model to understand the brain tissue. So there was kind of an example from, uh, from British Eventing as well. Yeah, so going into kind of the, the results, these are preliminary results. So far, we've been able to reconstruct uh, 20 cases, 10 concussive and 10 uh, no injury cases. And this data here shown is both racing and eventing grouped together. So measured common uh, variables, measured in headed impacts. So we have your linear acceleration, rotational acceleration, rotational velocity, and maximum principal strain. And the, the blue is your uh, concussive group, and the red is, your no in, is our no injury group. And across all variables, we saw the concussion produce significantly higher uh, results than no injury. And also, kind of up to put here, kind of 50% uh, risk. So these numbers are associated with an idea of where concussions might, might start to uh, occur. So you get uh, 60 G, 200,000 radians, uh, 25 radians per second squared, and about 23% uh, strain. So I'm moving on to the next part. So I'm going to ask a question. So uh, everyone who's had an accident while riding and has hit their head, can they please put up their hand? Lots of people. Can you oh, keep your hands up? <laughs> can you can now? Can you keep your hand up if you replace your helmet after this accident? So some. So after that accident, did you get a new helmet? So lots of hands went down. Okay. So one of the other things that we study is the actual damage that occurs from from an accident. So we get these people have an accident and they return them through many different uh, helmet return policies, such as the ones that uh, British Equestrian Trade Association is running. So, so far to date, we've analyzed over 100 helmets. And we're kind of hoping to finish this, this phase of study kind of in, in the summer. So within this kind of research, we'll visually kind of inspect the outside of the, of the shell. So kind of for any cracks or damage, um, scuff marks, as you can kind of see in the picture. We'll also then take apart the helmet and then analyze the inside of the shell for any kind of delaminations, that's kind of a discoloring that you see in the middle picture there. And then we'll also analyze the liner itself. So what, is there any crushing to that liner? And we can measure the amount of crush that happens there. So from these damaged helmets, we've been able to identify impact locations uh, from, 75, from 75 of them. So it's pretty evenly distributed around the head, maybe with slightly more impacts towards the, towards the rear. And then trying to associate the damage with injury. So of the ones we've analyzed so far, 63, or sorry, 83 of those had reported um, accidents. 
and then 62% of that 83 had an associated head injury. Now, going to kind of in that in that injury, 69% of those with an injury had some sort of damage. But kind of hot, interesting uh, thing that we found was 31% of those with an injury, uh, or sorry, 31% of the helmets showed no damage at all. So we wanted to kind of understand what's what's causing the damage and where are these different things. So one thing we want to kind of further break down is to look at the different impact surfaces. So we have impacts to the to the road. Uh, we had four cases of those, two concussive and two no injury, as well as impacts to turf surfaces and 14 concussion and two no injury in, in those cases. So kind of when we look at just our visual kind of inspection of the damage, uh, we saw all the helmets that were impacts to the road had sustained some sort of damage. Now, majority of the, tur the impacts of the turf did have damage uh, that we noticed, but we also noticed, again, this is kind of 35, so about a third of them pops up with no damage. And again, they're looking at the liner. So we can see there's a large proportion of those turf impacts in the red that have no damage. So kind of what are the initial kind of findings from this? So all the road impacts had sustained damage. So this, we kind of expect this because the way standards are currently is an impact to a hard surface. So we expect it to absorb energy in this case. More significantly, however, was that 35%, seven of the cases that we saw no damage, and five of, five of which were concussive. So in this case, people have, people have had an accident and the helmet has no evidence of uh, absorbing any energy. Two possible factors. One is the impact did not occur on the helmet, and the second one could potentially be, because from other research we know, the ground is actually relatively soft, so it can be absorbing the energy rather than the the helmet itself. So just kind of sum up a little bit about the, the standards. So again, you have the rigid surface standard. There's also a, a lateral uh, crush kind of one. And a new, new proposed standards coming out is a, onto an angled surface to kind of elicit the rotation of the head. So kind of one thing that we want to do is, okay, now that we have, we're trying to introduce these rotational tests, we want to have a head form that accurately reflects this. So. A lot the head forms that have currently been developed have been adopted from a car crash um, and based on linear, linear acceleration. Uh, but we, so we wanted to develop a head form with kind of from a broad range of literature with correct mass and inertial properties so we can develop uh, properly measured rotational accelerations. As well, the anvil that we're impacting. So we wanted to research into that and to kind of develop a turf surrogate anvil that, can be, that could be used to test helmets in a more realistic uh, condition. And kind of just the comparison of uh, real-world accidents to the standards. So the standard as it is today is in, is in blue on the slide there. And then that proposed standard onto that angled surface is in red. And then those kind of crosses are the concussive injuries. So you can see there's a wide kind of disconnect between what the standards currently are testing to to where the injuries are happening. So we want to develop tests that can better reflect those, and those are kind of the, the triangles and the little little crosses that are within the uh, injury concussions there. So these these might be solutions to to better represent what's actually happening in the real world. As well, kind of dynamic crush. So at the moment, it's just a kind of quasi-static test. So we want to see okay, the horse is actually landing on you with significant motion. So we want to develop a head form for that, and as well a horse surrogate model, so we can test helmets in these in these crush environments. So kind of the take home messages from, from this are that the in-depth kind of analysis of uh, video and uh, helmets will greatly help us to under understand brain injury and helmet performance. So at the moment, the standards may not reflect the conditions that the injuries are happening in and the helmets may not be providing adequate protection. So Standards, methods, and helmet designs could improve by accounting for the, um, those uh, common impact scenarios. Right, thank you. Thanks very much, Mitchie, and congratulations for doing that at fairly short notice. And Michael, I hope you enjoyed that. Um,
The third paper in this session on equestrian safety is looking at the use of data to manage risk uh, in equestrianism. And I'm delighted we've got Sam Watson, who is the founder of Equi Ratings, who's going to give us a chat about data-driven risk management. Sam, over to you. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. Uh, a very interesting morning so far, an interesting afternoon. And uh, one of the things I took away th this morning was that uh, things are changing all the time and attitudes are th changing. One of the biggest changes for me is that there's an Irish event rider now talking about risk management. Um, <laughs> and, and to prove that I, I am Irish, I, I served a bit of time over here as a young rider learning how to ride and I was sent a young racehorse and the horse didn't steer very well so the Irish boy had to ride it. And then they, once I got it steering a little bit better, they said he also doesn't jump very well, so I had to, to jump him too. And I took the horse out onto a cross-country course that they had, and um, I found one fence was causing us a, a bit of bother as I was getting climbing back onto the horse for the second time. And um, <clears throat> the man who had built the fence came out and said, Irish, you're, you're jumping the fence the wrong way around. <laughs> I've learned... I've learned a lot since then. I've gone to university since then as well, where I studied uh, data analysis and statistical analysis. And thankfully, I hadn't lost all my brain cells, and, and I managed to do quite well in university. Um, but then you can still question my sanity, because I then went on to be an event writer for the, for the next 10 years, uh, having graduated. I didn't have an original idea when I thought about applying data analysis to equestrian sports. I was copying a lot of people. It actually started back in the 12th century when um, knights were trying to capture titles and things like that. That was my, my uh, co-founder put that in there, and it kind of shocked me when I saw a 12th century knight up there. Uh, the people that I was inspired by were Bill James in baseball. Uh, he was the, when re recruiting players in sport. Uh, everybody used to go off their instinct and their intuition and that's something that we do a lot in equestrian sports and it's something that's very important and, and it's something not to be lost. But actually what analysis can do and what data can do is it has the power to quantify ability rather than just using intuition and, and the margin for human error and for human bias as well to come into it. Um, and so this is why I, I started the analysis. I wanted to see what it took to win aside from just being a genius or, or a god or, or these things that I couldn't quantify and I couldn't aim for because it was intangible. I actually wanted numbers and metrics to hit. Um, and there's good examples up there of how it's being braced now with rugby and cricket and of course British cycling as well where one of the things that they talk about there is marginal gains. They measure everything and look for a 1% gain across the board and that leads to a much bigger gain. And we acknowledge our role in safety the data analysis, in particular performance analysis, which is the area we'll get onto, uh, it is just one of the tools. And there's a lot of things going on that are really positive towards horse welfare and towards risk management, uh, from fence design to safety equipment, and, and we've seen examples of that. Uh, what we do, essentially, is we turn, we had good, good talk about databases earlier and all this data and the quality of it. Uh, we try and turn that into insight. And we do it for, for three reasons, really. Risk management, team performance, which we call high performance, and fan engagement. So we take the Olympic Games last year in the sport of eventing. Uh, there was a horse there called the Biostatic Sam, ridden by Michael Young. They went on to win the, the gold medal. Now, a bit of insight there from a fan engagement point of view is that horse in London became the only horse in the modern era of, of the sport to finish on his dressage score. Uh, that's two rounds of show jumping and to go clear inside the time cross country. And what he managed to do in Rio is he repeated the feat. So it's now only been done twice, but it's been done twice by the same horse and rider four years apart. So that's one to, to engage the sport and by giving people information, which when we watch Wimbledon now and we hear about percentage of break points won and speeds of second serves and all this, fans and people who enjoy sport actually crave information. Uh, when you see the titles of data-driven risk management, it doesn't sound too exciting, particularly after lunch on a Thursday. Uh, but actually, data can be quite exciting. Team performance, the man who designed the cross-country course at Rio had designed two championships before, and a European championships and a world championships, and the Olympics was his third championship. On all three occasions, he managed to produce a clear cross-country rate of 42%. 
all in very different con conditions, but that's why we call a Michelet the menace, because usually it'd be about 55% clear rate, maybe even 60% clear rate. So that was a tough, challenging course, and that's to give insight to the managers to say, just watch out that the cross-country phase could well be very influential with this person designing. But then risk management. There were 15 combinations out of 65, so 15 horse and riders, horses and riders, who went to Rio with less than a 50% success rate at three and four star level going into the Olympics. So their form coming in on the cross-country phase was 50-50. Only one of those 15 managed to jump clear, and they did so with a lot of time penalties. And half of the horse falls, so the, the pictures that we've seen in the last presentation of those, what we don't want to see in the sport of, of horses falling, had come from that smaller population with lower performance. So that was to sort of get the, the ball thinking is our performance and risk linked here. Quick. Quick, quick history on us, or I'll get time penalties myself in this presentation. Uh, my business partner, top left there, Dimit Byrne, was a commercial lawyer. We were in college together in university, and without him, like, like any event writer, nothing would actually get done if I didn't have somebody to help me uh, to do everything. Um, he's always found data in sport fascinating, and at badminton in 2015, someone who had known nothing about horses, he never came to watch me do any events when we were in college, uh, he was too busy chatting up girls, and then he actually, at my wedding, met an event rider, and that's when he started to follow the sport. <laughs> um, but he found himself at, at badminton starting to help out with the commentary, and this was someone who'd known nothing about eventing, and commentators were saying, God, how are you, how are you, he was saying, you know, this person should do about somewhere between a 42 and a 45 in the dressage, and they're coming in and, and hitting these numbers bang on. And that was, that was the start of it with media. We started to consult at a high performance level back in 2015 as well, and we launched this, this quality index, which we get onto in more detail as well in 2015. Everything has escalated since then. We're, we're uh, media services, more events, helping more Olympic teams, and our risk management has now spread. It's diversified from just eventing into the sport of endurance and now also into racing as well. We're starting to look at that, all investigative stages at the moment. Our philosophy is that risk management can be managed efficiently. So I, I talked to a very wise event writer who probably had one fall too many who said, I don't fall off half, half as much anymore. And I said, yeah, but you ride about a third as much. Um, so that wasn't an efficient fall presentation. He was actually inefficient. He was actually falling more for the amount he was riding. Um, but we, so, so that's, that the, the efficiency of it is important. We don't want to halve our, our risk by halving our participation. That's not what we want to achieve. Um, recognizing the relationship between performance um, and, and risk. That's very important. You know, speed is a risk factor, and it is with driving, so we have speed limits on our roads, but we still allow for Formula One because that's the top level of the sport. And I think we have to be very careful that this great sport that we have, which involves a horse who, who's very dear to us, we. We still want to be able to, to push the boundaries of high performance, but we want to do it safely. So that's very much our, our philosophy behind our analysis. It gives us this risk matrix of the relationship between performance and risk. High performance, low risk, that is the mecca. That's what we're looking for. These athletes at all levels of the sport, whether it's the Cheltenham Festival or whether it's the Olympic Games, who can perform to the very top level and we can all really admire the horse in, in all its glory, performing to the top of its level and they can do so safely. That's what we're looking for. What we've got to be careful is when we're performing to the top level but the risk is, is high. It's, it's 50 fit. We're exposing ourselves to risk. That's what we have to manage and sometimes make quite difficult decisions. Low performance, low risk, that is, that is participation. That is what probably 95%, that's what we want it to be as well. I say, I say lower levels of performance. My wife is an amateur eventer and she wins far more rosettes than I do. Um, so it's not about performing poorly, it's about performing at a lower level. And then low performance, high risk. That's where I was talking probably about the Olympic Games example. You know, where the, the form is just, the, the level of performance is probably just, they're trying to compete a little bit above where the data is suggesting they're ready. But again, because this is sport and because of the will and desire to win, uh, they're pushing the boundaries. So that's where it, actually an analysis system to take the human bias out of it. I wouldn't want to be the team manager. I wouldn't want to be the official that has to tell some of these people that you shouldn't be competing today at this level. It should be at the level below. Um, so it's actually a system on a computer. It's not me. 
measure and manage. Uh, so that is, that's, that's a big model we have, and, and you, you, you'll get that from what we've talked about. That's just a, a normal distribution curve. Most of us sit in the middle of that, and then some of us are particularly positive outliers, some particularly negative outliers. If we think about it in terms of um, performance and in terms of risk as well, the day I went out and started jumping cross-country fences backwards on a four-year-old was when I was getting to the, to the left-hand side of the curve. You know, that didn't need to happen. That was just particularly um, Irish of me. <laughs> Our objective, acceptable risk. That's a word, a phrase that I, I want people to think about. Acceptable levels of risk. It's impossible to remove it completely. I got on an airplane here this morning. You know, I had to drive to get to the, to the airport. Uh, I've been taking on risk the whole time. I don't know exactly what I ate at lunchtime, but I think it was pretty healthy. But acceptable <laughs> levels of risk, it, it, that's an important thing to think about. So we're looking for perfection. Uh, we're looking for what we can, we can cope with in the sport. Our strategy is, we've heard this morning about raising standards, it's, it's to look at the lower levels of performance where the highest levels of risks tend to be. And that, that's, the, that's the work that, that our team have been doing is, is in showing that, that that's the, where the efficiency can come. And by actually working on, on the bottom, the left-hand side of that curve that you saw where the risk is particularly high, by addressing that and redirecting it to a level where they are at lower risk, that's how we can raise the standards. Rather than trying to make fences smaller or um, to reduce speeds or, or to do anything like that, which will actually take quite an element of the sport away. We want to be able to have high performance, but we want to have it safely. And then our tactic is to produce these ratings and to quantify, to quantify the risk. Um, my wife once, when she was driving, she was still in England at the time, she went through a village and she got speeding points. She didn't know the camera was there. and she, Unfortunately, she, she didn't see the camera. So when she came back through the village, she got even more speeding points. <laughs> that, that sort of half hour in her life does not mean that she was now more likely to have a crash and it didn't mean that she was a dangerous driver necessarily. She could have paid probably a little bit more attention to, to things on the side of the road. Um, but that worked, it influenced her behaviour. And I think that we, we can move to a stage where we can actually attribute performance and risk ratings to people. It's been done in other sports and it's worked in other, uh, or other spheres. We call ours the, the Equi Ratings Quality Index, and I just want to talk quickly in the last few minutes about what, it, what is the, really the essence behind these individual ratings. Uh, and the first is individual responsibility. You know, taking back to that uh, example of the, uh, the points for speeding, that's influenced her straight away to actually be a little bit more careful. That's going to be the same. If your, perform, if your level of performance, your outcomes at a certain level in a sport are showing high levels of risk and your rating is starting to drop and starting to get to the low towards a level where you might not be able to compete it's saying to you okay this is on me this is not the regulators saying that we have to apply more rules across the whole sport for everybody it's actually saying that you're in control of your own performance to a level and you have to take responsibility to a level to influence the behavior so for people to say well okay i mean i've always wanted to take this horse to badminton Maybe it's a year too soon, but I'll chance it. If that, that chance, that's got to be more calculated now. Maybe you should be waiting an extra year, and maybe a system like this can, can help, because for the first time, negative consequences have actions uh, regarding your ability to perform. We've always had the negative outcomes have consequences, but we can, at high-level sport, we can be very good at ignoring those, those consequences. <laughs> to promote training and education so when you're running into to problems that your solution is actually to say right I'm, I've, I've got a system here that's telling me that, that all is not well and all is not where it should be so I will, I will seek training and I'll seek to try and improve my performance that way which is a really important element and I just want to finally leave it with, with, with that, that concept of, of raising the bar of saying that actually we want performance to be higher. If the performance is higher, the risk is lower. And I don't want to, to leave it to chance. I think it's, it's about time for talking about change. So thank you.
Thank you, thank you very much, Sam. Please, uh, again, store up your thoughts and questions. Right, the final session, final paper in this session is from Jonathan Clisold, the National Safety Officer of British Eventing, who's going to talk about safety in eventing. So, Jonathan, welcome and over to you. Hey, Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm glad that um, Michelle and Sam have gone before me because that takes a lot of pressure off my quite simple presentation, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what British Venting do uh, to manage the risk, as Sam was talking about, and different uh, things that we cover. Um, course inspections. All courses at all British Venting events are inspected the day before the start of competition by an approved BE steward and technical advisor. All the fences are checked that they are safe and within the rules of the class. Every fence on every course is measured, its height, top spread, base spread, jump or width, and it's allocated a fence type and profile. And this data is all recorded by the technical advisor and held in the BE database. Now the falls that happen on these courses, the fence judges fill in a full report form and this gives um, all the details and circumstances of what's happened. This information is also then transferred into the database. And by doing this, we can analyse this data and it enables us to see types of fence where falls occur, level of courses that have falls, circumstances that are common in falls, any trends that might develop, and improvements we can make to that course in future years or types of fences we can improve profiles of. Annually, every year, the Transport Research Laboratory carry out an independent audit of the season's safety data to look to see if there's anything that could lead to improving safety across the cross-country phase that we haven't seen that they look at from their expertise. Falls are divided into three categories, and they're unseated rider falls, no somersault horse fall, and somersault horse fall. We've been collecting data now since 2002 so we can calculate the percentage risk of serious injury from each type of fall. The unseated rider only has a risk of 2% serious injury. The non-somersault horse fall, 7%. But massively higher, you can see, is a somersault horse fall, 28% risk of being seriously injured. So how can we improve the outcome of a fall? Through course design, we can use frangible devices, which mean the fence might react in certain circumstances when a horse goes into a serious fall, the fence might react and collapse so the fall stops. We can improve ground lines on fences to make the profiles more nicer. And something else we've been looking at is colour and definition, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, PPE, we've heard Michel talk about hats and everything, and um, as he touched on, we're in a bounty scheme with Beta, so any rider that has a fall and has a concussion, we take their hat off them, that gets sent into University College Dublin to be tested. In return, that rider gets a £100 voucher towards a new hat. Uh, body protectors. Uh, we insist on a high standard of level 3 body protector that the riders have to wear. So when they've actually put a body protector on, they zip it up, they've got a level of protection. Then if they choose to wear an air, air jacket on top of that, that might give them added protection. But an air jacket only gives protection when it's inflated. So by insisting on the level 3 body protector, they've got protection from that the moment they put it on. So reducing the risk, what can we do? When the competitors enter the competition, they have minimum eligibility requirements. And that means they have to have qualified up levels before they go to a certain level. And also we've been looking and working with ECHO ratings and looking at, looking at their, as Sam says, the ratings that people have and the chances of how well they're going to do at that level and whether they're ready to run at that level. Uh, training. We have an incident and discipline list. So if someone is thought to be riding recklessly or um, in other ways, bad behavior and stuff, they get put on these lists and these are referred to the next official, the next event, so they can make sure they're not doing that again. If they are seen to be riding dangerously, more than one event, they'll then get referred to somebody from the list of uh, B coaches. So they have to have some training. We also have horse fall protocols. So if a horse falls twice within a 12-month period, it gets referred and looked into, and again, gets referred to training. See something we've done about making it jump better. So research we're involved in. Um, the HEADS project, we talked to um, 
we share about that. At Creative with Sam. Uh, risk factors in horse falls. Heather, who's pushing the microphone around here, um, help, is helping us. She's doing a PhD from Myerscough College. And she's looked into a lot of our data and looking at what other things might influence horse falls. And Equine Vision, which is a very interesting project that Sarah Paul and Martin Stevens have been doing down at um, Exeter University. You might have seen in the press recently and on BBC Radio 4, there's been some work they've done with the BHA as well, as to steeplechasing, whether the orange knee rails and toe rails are the right colours for horses to see. And some of her work has suggested it perhaps isn't a good colour. So I'm going to show you a few slides from her project, which I find very interesting, I hope you do. So the background of the project is trying to understand how horses' vision affects the way that the horse sees fences and jumps them, and other features in their environment around the course. So you see the bottom pictures here. Uh, the one on the left is what you see, the fence, the show jump there. That's how you see it. And you can see on the right, that's how the horse sees it. Um, the current work that's been going on is investigating fence edge visibility. Images taken at Bixton and Babington, at the B90 and 100 grassroots level, and at the four star at Babington, and a range of show jumps at different levels. Woody and orange coloured edges are particularly low visibility. So you can see here that some of the uh, grass and the woody fences just blend into one for the horse and aren't very defined. Can you see these all right? Um, yellow and blues improve fence edge contrast. So it's obviously important that a horse can <coughs> read a fence well before it can jump it. And here you can see with the yellow and blue use, it does define the edge of the fence. Particularly here, you can see now on the show jump at the top there, we see the orange and greens look very clear to us. The two pictures at the top where the horse sees it, those all blur into one really. So the white is the thing that the horse sees clearest. Again here in different types of light, at the top is what the horse sees and the bottom is what we see. They don't see any of that bright orange at the side on the wings. So in a summary of what they found the work they did last year is woody and orange coloured edges in particular have low visibility to horses. Yellow and blues improve fence edge contrast. The shade and texture, this is an interesting one, matte and gloss paint colours strongly influence the, whatever that word says, I can't read it. <laughs> I can't spell it anyway. Um, the lighting conditions, bright sunshine versus cloud, can strongly influence the jump appearance. And more quantitative data on faults and horses' vision is to come in the work we're doing this year with them. So the key future questions they're going to look at this year are how do light conditions and weather affect the perception of fences in, in eventing? What are the roles of acuity, distance, perception and view? Role of visual distractions around the course and fences? We heard earlier from um, about the, bit, the horses shying at things and seeing ghosts out the ground with its little bag. Again, the same thing around the cross-country course, things that horses see that frightens them, what we can't actually see that it's going to cause a problem. And what role does vision and fence appearance play in training? Is this something that the trainers should be using in a training tool to get horses used to things they're going to see out in the field in competition? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jonathan. Right, if those four panellists can come up here... We'll have a little question and answer session, please, to look at this whole question about equestrian safety. Uh, we've, as usual, got microphones, a bit of luck. Uh, so, any questions, thoughts? You've had four very different, but actually pretty related uh, subjects. So, thoughts, questions? That's Sam Chubbuck from World Horse Welfare. I've got a question for Alan. Uh, firstly, thank you for everything you're doing to improve horse and rider safety. I, in my personal um, drivings around the lanes, often see horses and riders out, bay horses, riders wearing dark colours and no high vis. And I always want to say something to them, and I don't know how to address that in a sort of tactful way, a non-confrontational way. I'm sure I'm not the only person here who feels like that, and I wondered if you had any advice on if there's anything we can do in that situation. Don't. 
<laughs> no, the only reason I say that, I feel exactly the same way as you. I, I, I see it. Even going past the British Horse Society headquarters, you know, I'm chatting to Lynn about something, probably getting a rollicking. But, um, <laughs> nicely, I'm sure. Uh, nicely. Yeah. There's, there's a horse that goes back, and I'm looking through the window, and I'm saying, Lynn, look at those riders. I really don't know why. And our, our research with the Transport Research Laboratory, if you were to read that, there is no way that you would go on the roads without wearing conspicuous clothing. There really isn't. And I find it incredible <laughs> that riders still go on. Uh, out, out without it, because now we've got scientific evidence that proves it. So, depending on how tactful you are, um, if you know them, up to you. But uh, there are some uh, some people out there that would uh, that, that have their own views and just don't want to know. Lady down there, and then. Hello, I'm Claire Gabriel from the Pony Club. Um, I'd like to ask about hats. Um, do children fall off differently and do their heads behave differently when they fall off? That's an interesting, interesting that's a, one. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, we, like, at the moment, we're not looking into children. It's definitely kind of an area that we want to we wanna access. Um, but we, just, we haven't had necessarily access to the children data. So it's a great question and hopefully we can answer that for you in the future. Was there was one at the, yeah. And then. Hello, Nikki Hudson, I'm a chiropractor. Uh, following up from the lady's question on rider safety on the roads, one of those horses that were killed earlier this year, I happen to know, the incident happened at dusk, the rider had no high vis on at all. The horse somersaulted over the car and was killed on sight and the rider was seriously injured. Regardless of responsibility, he shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have been riding in those conditions. Is there any comeback on him? Right. Well, what I would say is insurance companies do look at what the circumstances were in the accident. So again, you know, if you go out on the road and you don't wear conspicuous clothing, it's not going to say that your insurance company won't pay out, but they might not pay you as much because you haven't uh, actually taken as many... Uh, uh, factors or responsibilities as you should. And again, I really, it's tragic, tragic circumstances. And you just wonder what a rider's thinking, all right, them, themselves, but their horse. The horse doesn't have a choice. We put the, uh, the conspicuous clothing on them. One day, perhaps, they'll say, hang on, I want a quarter sheet and I want uh, those biomotion leg bands. But until that, that, uh, that time comes, I'm afraid the riders have to take responsibility for themselves and the horses, but particularly tragic, I know. Okay, there's lots of questions. Right, one in the front and then one up the back, and then Peter Clark at the back. Uh, Nigel Oakley, I, most of the questions have been with regard to riding horses. I uh, drive brewery drays quite regularly on the road, and, and modern day motor traffic doesn't seem to have any, any idea of what horse drawn vehicles are all about. In fact, <laughs> Excuse me, the London breweries have packed up and, and one of our main concerns with the heavy horse is to find a viable use for it. Um, have you any thoughts on what can be done to improve that situation? Okay, um, in London I'm having a meeting with the Metropolitan Police on Friday and we're discussing how the Metropolitan Police can perhaps help with this close pass operation with their mounted branch unit. If you're having a problem at your particular brewery, maybe I can ask them with their, their, their tactics and the way that they, they're going to run this operation. Maybe they can come and have, perhaps have a, ch a chat to you and you take one of your, your, your drays out and, and see, see where it goes. But, you know, again, we, we, we talk about carriage drivers as well in the same way as we talk about horse riders and horses. You know, we tell drivers, we see a carriage on the road, and there was that dreadful accident with the, uh, the funeral cortege where the car overtook and cut in and took out that leading. So we're sending the same messages out to um, carriage drivers as well as horse riders. But I'll have a chat with you afterwards. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay. Lady up, up there. Hi. Um, I, I just had a comment to make, actually, and then a question Sorry, as could you, well. Sorry, could you say who you are, please? Uh, my name's Nicola Chamberlain. I'm um, an equine behaviour counsellor. Um, but in a previous life, I was a personal injury lawyer. Um, 
<laughs> and my husband's actually in the insurance industry as well. So I just had a sort of a, a flash thought that went through my mind. Um, basically, in response to the other lady's question, <laughs> um, yes, certainly, if a rider is found to be um, partially responsible for um, an accident themselves, i.e. they weren't uh, visible, it's highly possible that they will have been found to be contributory negligent in, with regard to the accident. That's the um, word I was looking for. <laughs> um, in which case, not only um, would they possibly receive a payout for their own losses and injuries, but their insurance company, if you have an insurance company, may well be liable to pay some of the driver's losses as well. So that then sort of brought me on to the next comment, really that um, certainly recently insurers have been employing a black box type system, especially for younger drivers, um, which does um, records uh, the sort of speeds and the times they're driving, that sort of thing. And I was, uh, if they're driving well, then they get a discount on their insurance policy as an incentive. And I was just wondering if there's anything, for example, the BHS could do with your rider insurance policies that, um, employ the same sort of reward-based tactic. So if riders are shown to be wearing the right sort of clothing and they are involved in an incident, um, or, or their insurance policy will be uh, reduced, give them that incentive to do it rather than just a safety incentive, which doesn't seem to be working. Um, well, I don't know if it's working or not. I think there's, there's work, work to do, but um, yes. Sorry, I, I, yes. <laughs> I, your, I, your, your, your scheme is definitely bringing it to a lot of people's attention, but you've highlighted yourself, and we've all highlighted yeah. that the message is getting through, but maybe it would get through even more if people thought they would have a financial incentive yes. because they might just think, well, I'm popping out for a five-minute ride. What could happen? Do, do you know what? I totally agree with you, and I would like to engage the insurance companies with that, and we have a mechanism that we can do that. But the other thing I would like to say is our ride safe training and qualification. I would love to see that if riders take that and they, they pass the assessment, that that also maybe has an effect in, in their, in their insurance. So they're going out on the road, they've taken our ride safe qualification, they've, they've passed the assessment, and uh, they, they get some incentive for that. But I totally agree with you. In fact, I'll have, I'll have a word with you afterwards as well, if I may. Peter Clark. Thank you, Joan. Peter Clark. Having been involved with the horse industry about 60 years, living in the rural areas in Hampshire and uh, Devon, I'm appalled at what I can say is an old fashioned word the lack of manners by a lot of the horse riders, not all of them by any means, but an awful lot. And if you've got some um, younger fit people who don't like horses anyway, and they aren't thanked for slowing down, what do they do next time? They put the boot down and go as close as they can to the horses. So I do feel there is a lot there to be done as far as trying to educate a lot of these people. Okay, again, I, I, I totally agree with that. And we run rider and road awareness evenings around the country. You know, having 80 riders there, 70 riders there, 100 riders there. And we actually say, thank drivers, love them. Even if you say it with clenched teeth, thank you. Say thank you to drivers. Love them and they will love us. You know, wide eyes, big smiles. You know, and I totally agree with you. And that's what I'm saying. There's a shared responsibility for this horse, riders, and drivers. Uh, and on that basis, um, most um, riders are drivers. Very few drivers are riders. Um, by them. Now, I have a question for the two um, on the end here. Sparked, actually, by that concept that e you have cars which can monitor driving. So how would you monitor riders? the only option seems to me to be in a helmet somewhere. Does that then affect the research you can do? How safe could a helmet be if you included that in it? And does the, would the data support that kind of development? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so... One of, the, one of the good parts is to have, kind of, I guess, monitor things or videos at the moment. Now, in terms of monitoring kind of everyday accidents, people are kind of looking at putting helmets or cameras on their helmets. 
Now, what the influence that is at the moment is still kind of very uh, new kind of question and hasn't fully been answered yet. Uh, so we don't know that aspect. Um, but also coming out to the market are things like accelerometers to put in your helmet. Um, so these could potentially give, a, give an estimate of, okay, was there an impact here? And those kinds of things would be helpful to, to monitor everyday kind of impacts. Yes, and the, the use of wearable devices is definitely producing data that once we have enough of it, we can analyze it and then see is that giving us some significant readings. And it, we've had some interesting conversations here today of, of companies that are doing that and investing a lot in it. Um, e for a whole wide range of things. We, we could actually start getting data on um, the safe times of night to be riding. If you, if you have a tracker on horses all the time, if we could see that trackers, you know, trackers that are out later at night are having more accidents, uh, that could be interesting information. We're talking about heart rates. I think there's been work done on that uh, to do with horses getting tired towards the end of a course and potentially being uh, more likely to fall then, and that could tell us about fitness. So I think that, that the possibilities are endless, and I would encourage any one whose sparks going off in their head and they want to start going down that road to do and please get in touch it's going to be a busy coffee break there are all sorts of conversations going on yeah there. hello um so i'm pauline from trekkener or horse monitoring technology so Tracker for horses. So, just on, I had two different things. So, one thing is, we are so if we're open, we're open to any discussion about how our tracker could help for the safety also in the sport. So, again, talk to me if you want afterwards on that. But my other question was about because I'm an engineer, I'm interested in the new, the latest products about helmets. So, I was wondering, I saw these things for cycling, these airbags for cycling, where you fall and you have the airbag, and now we all know the airbags as body protectors. Uh, is there anything coming with helmets as airbags, or what is the status on that, or is it just not feasible and protective enough? I don't know. There's nothing that I know about it in terms of air airbag helmet in equestrian. Um, I'm sure it could be feasible. Um, probably talk to the Swedish developers who developed for cycling in the first place. Um, that might be a good place to start. You, you haven't looked at it yet at all? We, we haven't looked at the airbags for helmets, and I'm not sure if any other group who has at, at this time. Okay. Jeanette. Okay, sorry, we've got more. Go on there. Thank you, really. Um, Jeanette Allen from the Horse Trust. I just wanted to throw something else into this very august panel that's shown us some truly terrifying things today. Um, and that is the importance for anyone involved in equestrianism to have a very good knowledge of first aid. And the reason I mention that is knowing someone who came off their horse in an indoor school at a private livery, had actually sustained fractures of their C1 and 2, and the livery owner took their helmet off. Luckily, the lady managed to keep all her bodily functions due to uh, an external fixator because she didn't move her head, but she could have been quadriplegic or dead. So let's take the equipment seriously, but let's also know what we're doing to bodies when something goes wrong. I mean, I think we'd all, we'd all completely agree with that. I mean, I think that's a very, very important point, to be honest. Um, anyone want to comment further? I mean, I don't think... Just, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeanette, for that. Anybody else got any comments, questions? Roly. I'm worth a chance here, and Jonathan hasn't done anything, so yeah, I thought right, I'd so. give you a go. Um, <laughs> frangible pins, um, obviously, have been a lot in the, in the um, press and, uh, and the world of eventing. FEI recommend it, but don't require it. Australia now require it. What is British eventing's view on frangible pin technology? Well, British eventing have actually required frangible pins to be used where they can for some years now. And America have now gone down the same line. Um, there's another frangible device coming to market as well called the MIMS clip, which works slightly differently. Uh, but again, it is potentially can make a fence safer. But at the end of the day, all these devices, they're there to react if a mistake is being made and there's a nasty fall happening. But it won't, have, won't work for every fall. There's so many different mechanics in falls and the way they happen. And we've, we've seen horses rotate without even touching a fence. Just the way they land steeply, they can rotate over their own front legs. 
there's no one solution to fix all. It's a matter of training, you know, as I said, making fancy profiles nicer and you know, looking at all we can. But I, I was went to um, a safety management thing, the FBI ran a few weeks ago, and there was a presentation there that 86% of accidents um, are caused by mistakes. So what we've got to try and do is stop the mistakes, whether it be the horse not making a mistake or the rider not making a mistake. If we could try and reduce that a bit, that might help. <laughs> Miles. At an early stage, um, Miles Williamson Noble, I'm doing this as a, as a hunt follower. Um, at an early stage of my life, uh, I went to the neurological ward at Addenbrooke's, since when I have always worn a chin strap on the helmet I've had. In the early days, it had a cup over my chin, and since then, underneath. A large number of the hunting fraternity still maintain that if they have a properly fitted patey hat, they don't need a chin strap and it will stay on. And I suspect quite a lot of recreational riders also don't wear chin straps. Is there any data to support the frequency with which hats without chin straps do come off in a tip accident and generally, you know, it's head first that it, it comes down to? Interesting question. So, like, our, our research mainly focuses on kind of the mechanics of impact, so I'm not too familiar with, with that field um, that you're discussing right now in terms of that coming off, but my personal suggestion would be wear your chin strap. That's quite possible, yeah, so I'd say wear your chin strap to make sure your helmet stays on your head. But this is an interesting area. You can't enforce it. It's down to common sense and almost peer pressure. I think the pony clubs do great stuff. Yeah. By making sure that all the pony club members aren't generally the crash hats and, and chin straps. So I think the government can be fitted, but I'm, I'm not sure that Nakaba works like me. Would necessarily take them the job. We couldn't possibly comment, Miles. <laughs> Any other questions, or we'll, shall we have a comfort break? You all done? Right, well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Yeah. Siobhan Dillon from the Institute of Applied Equine Podiatry. Um, I'm just commenting about the use of inf um, reflective gear and stuff like that, because I've done cycling, running, as well as horse riding in my time. And constantly I see cyclists out there in dark clothing all the time and at night. Um, sometimes they have absolutely dazzling lights on them, but they are frequently also without uh, coloured clothing that can be seen easily, in particular when they're travelling at speed and they're so narrow. Um, so I think it's generally a cultural thing and a human thing. Um, and, and really, rather than just focusing on riders, it's, it's, it's trying to find the human thing that actually changes the mentality so that people will wear the, the reflective gear. So, because I see all vulnerable users out there in dark things that are so easily could be yeah. hit, you know, even if you are dri driving at steady speeds. Yeah. I, think that's a, I think it's a perfectly fair, good, sensible point. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for that session. Uh, please thank the panelists and. <laughs> Please, we've now, got, we've now got a 20 minute comfort break. If you could be back, please, by 10 past three, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you.
Probably the most shocking thing was that it was like a graveyard with the walking dead. They had so many lice on them that we had to, we had to do a full body cook to get rid of all the parasites before we could even start treating them. The scale of it seemed enormous. I think it opened the eyes of many members of the British public who hadn't seen animal cruelty before. 